Hello, friends, and welcome back to Malicious Compliance Stories. I like the way our OP's father thinks. Never pass up an opportunity to make jokes with buffoons. You'll see what I mean after a short pause. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. The gate is everyone's property, but it's our responsibility to fix it if it's damaged. Sure, let's remove it. So this happened to us a few months ago. We live in a private street that every resident own and share. And as such, there's a steel gate on each side. The street and the gate is the association slash residence property, association my father never joined, obviously. The gate was damaged, and since there's a school nearby, the residents asked it to be fixed as it was a liability for children. But if it was everyone's property, since it was right next to our house, it was our responsibility to deal with it. Read, we have to pay for it, because, huh, just do it. So my father received the mail, agreed that the gate was a liability, and had it removed by professionals. The other residents were furious, but it was their own word who declared the gate dangerous and my father's responsibility, so there was nothing they could do about it. They can now enjoy their not-so-private street. And our second story. You must be her boss. A long time ago, in a galaxy far away, I was her young soldier. I loved the army. I wanted to make it my career. I did it for a long time. I got injured, I couldn't do the job I was trained on anymore, so I got out and looked for other jobs. I do medical screening now. I'm older than everyone but two people in the entire building. On to the story. My immediate supervisor is 24, she's fairly young. A person didn't like her vitals and insisted that my boss did them wrong. There was absolutely no way her blood pressure was that high. You don't know what you're doing. That kind of horse crap. I came back from a break and this woman points at me and goes, I want your boss doing it. Him, you, show her how to do this. I said, lady, she's my boss. She goes, I don't have time for this. Read my vitals and deal with her after. My boss kind of smiled and I took her seat. I ran vitals again and got the same result. I said, well, I got the same result. Unfortunately, I need a supervisor to sign off on a correction. Sort of true, but not really. Let me get my boss. I stood up and turned to her and said, Hey, when you get a chance, can you confirm these corrections? She said, Yeah, I'm going to take a 10-minute break, but as soon as I get back, I'll knock that out. Sorry, ma'am. I can't overrule my boss. Like, instead of, Lady, she's my boss, she heard, I'm sorry for her incompetence. She's a new employee that we're training. Some people are just in a different world. And our next story. Working in the yard. I live in a consolidated county. That means that the city and county governments merged some years back, ostensibly to reduce administrative and infrastructure costs. This is important because services like fire, police, utilities, and trash pickup are now managed by former county officials and not the city officials. Many of these services are also much more inefficient, and some services have been outsourced to private companies. My municipality outsourced trash and yard waste pickup a few years ago, and the two companies who now do those collections are woefully inadequate. And their services cost more than when the city or county did it. They both have similar sets of rules, what can be put out for collection, take fewer types of waste away, and no longer come two days a week as the city once did. But now only come one day a week. We're all paying more money for less service. Now that the background's done, here's the story. I did some yard work over the course of a couple of weekends last summer, cutting some limbs, trimming some shrubbery, and cutting down a dead tree in my backyard, knowing what the rules are for how much yard waste, limbs, leaves, and such can be put out. I bagged everything that was supposed to be bagged, filling up three of them, things like leaves and small clippings, weeds, and such. The paper bags for yard waste from the big box home improvement stores are what they require, so I use those. I just fill them halfway up so as to not make them too heavy for the waste collectors, even though there are no written weight restrictions. However, if a bag is too full, they'll knock it over to spill out the content so they then don't have to pick it up. I cut the larger limbs down to under four feet in length or they wouldn't be picked up. Anything at all they can do to get out of picking something up, they'll do. 
and they almost always leave a horrendous mess behind when they do pick things up. The pile put out for collection is not allowed to be any wider than 10 feet, nor any deeper or higher than 5 feet, nor may it contain any piece longer than 4 feet. All bags must be placed in a row, no more than 3 feet away from the limb pile. My pile was maybe 4 inches longer than the 10 feet, and only because of the tiny ends of the limbs, smaller than a toothpick hanging out of the pile. The pile was no higher than 3 feet and no deeper than 4 feet. In other words, it fell within the size limits except for a few twigs with leaves. I also had the three bags, each about half full of clippings and leaves, all lined up exactly as required, and about two feet away from the main pile. They were scheduled to come on a Tuesday, but when I got home from work that afternoon, it was all still there. There was a pre-printed notice on my door that my pickup exceeded the prescribed size limits, and the note said that I would be required to either pay a $250 oversized load fee or reduce the size of the pile by half to make it fit into the limit. I had the next two days off, so the next morning, bright and early, I got out the hedge trimmers. I trimmed the ends of the pile back to exactly nine feet in length. After carefully laying those trimmed bits on top of the pile, I went to the backyard where the limbs I had not trimmed up the week before were stacked for the following week's pile and found four long, fairly straight limbs. I removed all the smaller limbs and leaves from these limbs, ending up with four moderately straight poles, each about seven feet long. I marked one-foot intervals on each pole in fluorescent orange paint and stuck them in the ground out at the curb in the front yard, at the corners of a rectangle exactly five feet wide and ten feet long. Got out the surveyor's tape, bright pink plastic tape used to mark property corners, and tied it onto and around the stakes at the height of five feet. This established a visual outline of the volume I was required to stay within. I made absolutely sure that everything in the pile was completely inside the poles and below five feet in height. This required adding almost two-thirds of the remaining pile in the backyard to the stack out front to bring it up to four feet six inches in width, four feet six inches in depth, and nine feet six inches in length, and no pieces longer than 46 inches. The pile was almost twice as much material as before. This included some small logs up to 4 inches in diameter, also each 46 inches long. The limit is 5 inches in diameter, all within the limits of 5 feet by 5 feet by 10 feet, the waste company mandates. I carried each of the three bags of clippings to the backyard and filled each of them up as much as possible while still being able to fold over the tops and staple shut each bag. I also included small 8 to 10 inch sections of the ends of larger limbs for added weight. The bags were now completely filled and weighed more than twice what they had before. I had to use the hand truck to get them out to the curb, they were so heavy. Oh, and all the extra clippings I had generated filled up two more bags, so the total was now five bags, the company limit. I then went inside, called the company, and very nicely asked that they come to pick up my yard waste since they'd not done so on Tuesday. They agreed to send out a truck and crew and told me I would have to pay the fee. Come on then, I told them. They soon arrived and happened to be the same crew that normally comes to my neighborhood. I pulled a 25-foot Stanley tape measure from my pocket and asked them to measure the poles to confirm that the space was within their required limits. They did so and agreed the pile was not oversized and proceeded to spend the next two hours manually loading it all into their truck. Oh, and it took both of them to manhandle each of those bags into the back of the truck, too. I told them, very nicely and with a smile, that I knew what 10 feet was, pointed to the fence where it was marked with orange electrical tape, and thanked them for coming to pick up my yard waste. The two tired, sweaty waste disposal guys just groaned, got in their truck, and drove off. There was no extra fee added to my bill for that month. Never has been since. Now, I know they got paid for their time, and I know that they had to do a lot of extra work on my day off. But since last July, I've not once ever had them leave so much as a single leaf on the ground in front of my house. They had to actually do some hard work with me standing there in shorts, smiling, drinking cold Gatorade while they were sweating. And our last story. The old lady that owned a pizza place building in my town. This is a funny pro-revenge story about how an old lady screwed over her entitled children. The actors in this story are Old Lady, O.L., owner of the building, she's 80-plus years old and has an apartment in the same building as the pizza place. Pizza Owner, P.O. 
owner of the restaurant and good friend of OL. Super Entitled Son, SES. Take note, this guy is 50 plus years old and one of the three old lady sons. They're all entitled and made a huge fuss, but SES was the worst. Background. In my town, there's a famous pizza restaurant. It's in a prime spot and always busy. I've known the P.O. since I was a kid, and I know he makes a ton of money from the restaurant. He's told me that he makes between $2,000 and $10,000 in profits each day, but he did not own the building and had wanted to do so since he started renting. O.L. always refused to sell, no matter the offer, and trust me, she's received huge offers. The story. This happened over a year. The OL received an offer from a bank for the building. Everyone in town learned about it because the offer was for over a million dollars. This is an incredibly high amount in my country. Of course, the old lady refused to sell. Here comes Entitled Kids. Apparently, all three learned that their mother got this massive offer, and because she's getting old, they wanted her to sell to move her into a retirement home. Since then, they've been insisting on her selling. That's the best she's going to get, and it would be the best for them to get that much money in their inheritance. Apparently, this PO'd the old lady so much, she went behind her children's back and offered to sell the place to PO for a fraction of the bank's offer. From what PO told me, she sold him the building for about $280,000, with a clause that he's not allowed to tear it down while she lives and that she's allowed to live in her apartment until she dies. P.O. agrees to the terms by O.L. and bought the place. O.L. made sure to have a doctor and lawyer check her to make sure they got all the legal stuff, indicating she was sane and what she was doing was on her own will. She was preparing for the crap storm that was coming and covering P.O. from the wrath of her entitled children. Boy, was she right. A week after the purchase was complete and P.O. became the sole owner of the building, O.L.'s oldest son showed up to the restaurant in the middle of dinner on a busy Sunday demanding to speak with P.O. From other people's testimony, he started yelling that P.O. was a scammer and that he took advantage of an old lady and he was going to be sued for all he had. When P.O. responded that he bought the place and that S.E.S.'s mother was the one that offered to sell the place to him, S.E.S. stormed to the O.L. apartment and began yelling to his mother, the other two sons were behind, nearby, yelling as well that he was going to take P.O. to court because he took advantage of an old lady and she was going to say in court that it was all true, even threatened P.O. that he was going to kill him for what he did. Somebody called the police and they handcuffed S.E.S. This is where it gets better. O.L. told S.E.S. and her other two sons that they were getting nothing out of her, even on her death. She'd already donated 80% of all her money to a charity and whatever she had left when she dies was going to the same charity. Sadly, I was not there, but I would give anything to SES and his brothers when she told him to suck it. OL's alive and well. PO's renovating the place, making it larger and nicer. SES got a restraining order to be at least 100 meters away from both PO. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video, and I'll see you in the next one.